Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you all at Whatever Happened to Privacy, our four-day conference on surveillance and control. This is the third day, our public event. My name is Christian from the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And, um, well, politics are supposed to make us lead happier lives. Unfortunately, in the last month, since the revelations of Edward Snowden, we had to find out that our privacy was invaded in a major, almost heinous way. Surveillance and control signal us we are not trusted anymore. From citizens, we have turned into suspects, all of us. This is why we decided to call together activists from all over the world, engaging in the fight to safeguard our private sphere. On a technical base, on a political base, and on a cultural base. A necessary answer for us is to get involved, be it on an activist level or simply in our daily lives. We are happy that so many of, of you have already joined us today and will join us today. We have prepared the voyage, starting with a message from the past, reaching out to an international sphere, discussing strategies, and finally, we will hear about a very personal story of somebody fighting at the front line of this not so virtual battle zone anymore. The internet had the big promise of freedom. It needs everybody's involvement to keep that dream alive. I thank all our partners who put this four-day event together with us, which are mine pirates who donate this wonderful space for us to be here, Berliner Gazette, the sea base where we started yesterday, and the Digitale Gesellschaft. And as well, of course, I thank our wonderful guests yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and speakers who have answered our call and are here today to get involved. Thank you. And I will pass on now to our wonderful curator, Geraldine de Bastien. Please, Geraldine. Thank you very much, Christian. Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to see you all here today and hope you will have a long but very enjoyable and rich day of knowledge and exchange with us here. So, as Christian said, uh, we are here now at Mind Pirates. It's the third day of our event. Uh, this format that we've developed, Mobilize, brings together activists, researchers, and experts from different corners of the world to come together in a mix of closed events where we work together, develop strategies, and work on collaborating um, between individuals and organizations, and public events. So yesterday, as Christian said, we kicked off in the sea base and had a wonderful opening evening there. I'm glad to see some of you made it back. And I think the empty chairs around you will be filled during the course of the day with the people that we left late last night in sea base. And so today is our full day um, of the public conference of this, this mobilized event, which is focusing, of course, on the topic of privacy and surveillance. As I said, we have a really fantastic group of people from all across the world that we've invited. Um, they're, I think, making up the majority of this half of the room. Maybe everybody who's kind of part of the mobilized privacy team can give a quick wave, a quick sign of your hand. These are all amazing people. You hear most of them speak during the course of the day. Uh, please seek them out in the break time, talk to them, and find out more about their doing um, outside of their talks on stage. I highly encourage you to do so. Um, it's a quick few words on privacy. <laughs> practical words on privacy. Uh, we are streaming this event and we are filming it, so this is a public event. Um, we also have a photographer here from the Heinrich Bell Foundation. Can you give us a quick wave? If there's anybody here who really objects to taking their picture taken, please talk to this gentleman and he will take that into consideration, but I promise you it only takes very beautiful pictures. Um, and of course there will be um, social media news. We have a hashtag that's MobilizeCon. Please use that when you send out tweets, and please be aware of that things said on stage might be tweeted. Um, if you want somebody not to share what you say, please also make a point of saying that so we know and others know. And uh, yes, I think with that, we're about ready to kick off with our first input. I very much look forward to our opening keynote. It's uh, one of these wonderful things that you can discover on, on this internet that we all love so much still, despite everything that's happened over the past months. 
and I would like to introduce to you Professor David Vincent, who is Professor of the Social History Department at the Open University of Milton Keynes, and has spent uh, much of his career researching and writing on the history of privacy, and is going to talk to us now about the Penny Post and explain why this is all just a little bit of history repeated. Please welcome Sir Professor David Vincent. Well, good morning to you and my thanks to De Geraldine and to the Foundation for this uh, invitation. This title has been given to me. I don't, in fact, believe that history repeats itself unless you ignore it. But it does supply us with origins and it supplies us with, with parallels. Where's my man? Now, what I want to talk about uh, this morning is this cartoon. Appeared in the... Uh, recently found, uh, founded satirical magazine called Punch in Britain in 1844. And it is, I think, the first ever depiction of the state surveillance of privacy and it is the forerunner of the cartoon which you saw in The Guardian uh, just now. And in this picture, you can see it shows the figure of Paul Pry, who is a comic theatrical figure, who I'll come back to in a minute, dressed up as Sir James Graham, who was the Home Secretary, the Minister of Interior at the time, and he's sitting in the, um, he's standing in the post office headquarters in London, opening the letters of private citizens. It's the government surveillance of private communication, here satirised and here the subject of protest. Now what had caused the trouble was uh, an Italian Republican called Giuseppe Mazzini who was trying to agitate for the independence of Italy from Austria and the Austrian government had chased him across Europe to Britain and there as a, a refugee he'd, he'd been communicating with other Republicans across Europe and the Austrian government asked him, asked the British government if they would open his mail and they did and Mazzini found out and he took it to Parliament, and there was an enormous public protest. Now, the figure of Paul Pry, who was used to illustrate this scandal, uh, was the hero of a play of 1825 um, put on in, in, in London, written by a man called John Poole. It was a comedy, and it was a sensational success, far greater than had been, had been expected. This is the next one. Yeah, Paul Pry, and on after. This is the theatre cheerfully saying we've got a hit on our hands. They always said this, but this time it was real. It took off. It played continuously throughout the following year, and I think about half a million people in London, and that's half the population, went to see it. Now, the unexpected success of this play had to do with its theme, which was about the invasion of privacy, and it had a catchphrase which was repeated all the way through the play and on all the objects which came out of it, I hope I don't intrude. And this captured the duality of the approach to privacy in the 19th century. Firstly, there was this enthusiasm for intrusion, this pleasure in finding out about other people's lives and about hidden knowledge. But secondly, it was now accompanied by a sense of apology that there were limits, there were issues of privacy. And in the 19th century, the debate swings back and forth between these two um, poles. And it was in this play that this debate was first set out. Now, it was put on in, into an enormously energetic uh, theatrical consumer culture. There was a huge range of mem memorabilia um, immediately on the market, like a Hollywood blockbuster in a way. There were songs, there were pictures, there were handkerchiefs, uh, there were um, figurines. You couldn't move in London in 1825-26 for 
um, objects associated with the play. And this is a, a figurine which was uh, immediately produced. It's on sale within a month of the play's first performance. Again, uh, this is um, a, 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 car a caricaturist who is using Paul Pry uh, as, as an image for his, um, his, his commentaries. And this is the standard visual representation. He became a fixed image, which then could be moved from location to location uh, to carry the um, arguments of the play into different contexts. And if you look at that image very carefully and then go back to the cartoon, you can see it's an exact copy. Those who are really looking hard will notice that the umbrella has been reversed, but otherwise it's deliberately taking off this play so the audience for this cartoon would immediately have all the associations of the play in front of them uh, as they thought about the issue of the state surveillance of privacy. And what I want to do in my time this morning is to consider five parallels between this event uh, and the issues of our own time. The connection between privacy and secrecy, the management of secrecy, the boundaries of the state, the issue of privacy panics, and finally, the behavior of consumers. And those five t issues will be, um, go take up the rest of this, uh, this talk. Okay, next one. Now, when the crisis blew up, when the debate started in Parliament, the government thought they would just, just had a problem of national security on their hands. How far it was right to open correspondence to protect the state. But its critics immediately realized that this was not just about national security, it was about the relationship between the state and private behavior. This is a commentary the following year. Take you down to the last line. The post office, it, it, they must be not only cheap and rapid, but secure and inviolable. inviolable. In 1840, four years earlier, the penny post had been introduced. This um, reformed the whole system of postage and introduced flat rate pre-postage. And this innovation was copied across Europe for the next 20 years. The objective of this reform was to make possible mass postal communication. It would be cheap and efficient and the state was now promoting correspondence between its subjects. And it was a very expensive reform. And what the critics picked up immediately was the possibility that the state was promoting mass communication in order to invade people's privacy. And it was that connection between a state-sponsored mass communication system and the vulnerability of people's private communication which structured the debate and gave it its energy at this time. Uh, another one, again, the same point being made this time by the Lord Chief Justice uh, that this invasion of people's postal communication was giving politicians insight into the secrets of people's private lives. That was why they were outraged. That's why the event in 1844 caused the trouble. Uh, that it did. Next one. Now, as to the management of secrecy, you need to know just a little bit about the political context of this period. In 1830-32, there was what's called the Reform Bill crisis in the UK, which was a major constitutional crisis, the nearest we ever got to a revolution in this century of revolutions, when the old corrupt political system was eventually reformed. And we had the modern state being created out of this reform after 1832. Then in 1838, we had Chartism, which was the world's first self-conscious working class protest movement. So for those running the country, there appeared to be very real threats from below, real dangers to the constitutional settlement, and a real responsibility for politicians to uh, conduct surveillance against those who they believed would bring down the state. Next one. 
At the same time, we're beginning to see the emergence of modern theories of openness in government. This is um, Jeremy Bentham, who died by now, but a posthumous paper by him was published the year before this crisis blew up, supplying really the standard assertion of the importance of openness in government. And you can see echoes of this sentiment all around us today as the Snowden issue is debated. Publicity is a fittest law for securing public confidence and causing it constantly to advance towards the ends of its institution. Secrecy is an instrument of conspiracy. Ought, therefore, not to be a system of regular government. So on the one hand, you've got a government frightened of its radical opponents. On the other hand, you've now got, in the public domain, a clear definition of the need for openness. Now, the government responded to this by inventing the doctrine of double secrecy. Not only did it demand the right to conduct secret surveillance, it also demanded the right not to discuss it. It invented a doctrine which in UK, and I think to an extent across Europe, has remained in place really until very recently and possibly still to this present day, that we will not either confirm or deny what we are doing. We will conduct our secret behavior secretly. And this doctrine was rolled out in this period. And the, in this uh, comment here, shouting themselves behind this official secrecy. This is the first time that the phrase official secrecy was used in British public discourse. The moment in which the debates we're now having began, and it began in the context as I say, of this notion of double secrecy. Yeah. Now, this gave the government two problems. Firstly, it meant that the issue of trust in government was redoubled. If they weren't going to tell you up or down, then you had to have confidence in their ethical integrity. And over the 19th century, the notion of honourable secrecy was developed, that the government could be trusted to be secret about its behavior because it was in the hands of men, it would be men at this time, of men of honor, who by their education and by their social training could be trusted to behave properly. And the history of secrecy, public secrecy over the period from 1844 is about how far that notion of honorable secrecy could go. And in the 20th century, how that notion of honorable secrecy began to fall apart. The other problem it gave them was the issue of deniability. If you refuse to say whether you're doing it or not doing it, one of the downsides for the government is that you cannot deny what you are not doing. And in 1844, as later, all sorts of conspiracy theories now flourished about the extent of government surveillance. Next one. Third point is about the boundaries of the state. The political discourse which was generated around this issue of postal espionage centered on a construction of Britishness. Proceedings cannot be English any more than masks, poisons, sword sticks, secret signs and associations and other such dark inventions. And here, next one also, is Thomas Carlyle, a famous radical writer of the time, uh, again, scornfully denouncing uh, other European countries, France and the old regime countries in Austria and Russia, not Germany, didn't care about Germany in those days, as being this place where these sorts of things happened. But Britain was a country of freedom and uh, ethical behavior and the 1844 crisis was fundamentally un-British. Now, to an extent, they could get away with this in this time, and it's one of the fundamental differences between the 19th century and our own times, in that the management of state secrecy was in the hands of the British state. There were no private companies involved at this time. 
no international orders, you could expect the British Parliament to be answerable for all that was happening in this realm. And that is obviously a change to the Snowden moment, except that the, what had provoked the 1844 crisis was the Austrian and British governments colluding in a joint attack on European radicalism. So even then, governments were conspiring with each other uh, to undertake concerted surveillance. Next one. Now you can argue that what you see in 1844 is the first public panic, the first public crisis about the state and privacy. And I think you can identify sort of the component parts of a privacy panic. And these elements I'll go through. Exposed abuse, attempted concealment, communication revolution, fear of networks, vacation of power, and media exploitation. Now, the scale of the, of the public excitement at this time really was very great. And I've just put this quote up here. It was like a match struck for a moment amid profound darkness, revealing to the startled crowd vague forms of terror of which they'd never previously had a glimpse. Huge sense of surprise, huge sense of shock, huge sense of unknown possibilities. So what you needed for this first of all was an exposed abuse. There had been letter opening. Mazzini was correct in supposing his letters had been opened. There had been an attempt to conceal it. The government had refused to uh, admit that it was doing it. And we were in the middle of a communications revolution. The railways were just, the first railway system was just being constructed at this time. Mass cheap literature was becoming available. The state had begun subsidizing education. Electric communication was being, they were just building the first electric telegraph uh, systems. And we had the penny post, as I said, in 1840, opening up the possibility of mass communication. It was the biggest change in mass communication since the invention of printing in the middle of the 15th century, the biggest change until the digital revolution of the last couple of decades. And there are historians who argue that the change in some respects was more profound than, than our current uh, revolution. And at this time, the notion of a network was being developed. The quote I put up in front of, on, the, on the screen there is, I think, the first ever use of the word network in its modern sense. The notion that everything was now being connected by communication systems, in this case, the telegraph, which was presenting you with new opportunities, but also with new uh, apprehensions. And you needed a really energetic newspaper industry, a really energetic forum for public debate, as we see around us now, as we see in this room, so also then. It was debated not just through in Parliament, not just through newspapers, but also in fiction. I've just put this example up. There was a genre at this time just developing of penny weekly serials, a bit like television. Every week, for a penny, you bought a new installment in a story. Anybody could buy it. Every week, you waited to see what happens. The one that was running at this time was The Mistress of London by, by Reynolds, selling 40 to 50,000 copies a week. And the point about a, this kind of serial was that you could change the story as things were going on around you. So Reynolds adapts his story to, to cope with the postal crisis. He invents this uh, institution, the Black Chamber, and this figure called the Examiner, who was a bureaucrat, an elderly gentleman with high forehead, open countenance, who walks into the post office, the same place that we saw uh, Graham opening the letters in just now. Again. And he glanced complacently around him, smile of triumph, Diabolical cunning, his whole countenance is animated with a glow of pride and conscious power. And what he's doing is opening everybody's letters. Opening the letters of the ruling class and being privy to their secrets, to their private lives. So this is, again, 
chilling the blood of the readers about the possibility of the government uh, being in possession and being able to blackmail uh, the ruling class about their secret misbehavior. So the crisis explodes into this world of popular journalism, which in turn uh, helps to make it uh, so vibrant. And I think those elements of the privacy panic in 1844 are clearly present uh, in our own times. Did not reappear much in the 19th century, um, largely because the state became much more cautious about its surveillance after getting its fingers so badly burnt in 1844. Okay, my final point is about consumer bargaining. We all of us know who have thought about the issue of the digital invasion of privacy. But it's not just about whether people value privacy. It's about the trade that people make between the exposure of their private lives and the gain of involving themselves in some kind of communication. Quoting here from Katz and Tosoni, the element of privacy is seeded consciously or unconsciously in return for participation in new forms of consumption or communication. Now, there, which means that to understand how people will behave, you have to understand how they are prepared to strike that balance in any particular context. And if you go back to the post, even then, there was a trade to be had. There was a possibility the state would inter in intercept your mail, and even if they didn't, someone might look over your shoulder when you're writing a letter in what was probably an overcrowded home, or reading a letter in an overcrowded home, or as was very common at this time, if you couldn't read or write very well, someone else would be reading or writing your letter for you and be privy to your secrets. Or letters hung around and then were rediscovered. And these kinds of risks were what the play of 1825 was about, and its novels and plays of the period are full of people getting themselves into trouble by writing letters about things they wish people not to know about. So those risks were there at the time, and correspondents had to decide whether to take the chance in this new world of state-sponsored postal communication. And again. What 1844 did was provide a wonderful moment of action research. Governments couldn't know really how much people cared until a crisis of this sort blew up. Then they would find out. And they could find out now because one of the things that happened with the Penny Post in 1840 is for the first time communication was connected to counting. The post office from 1840 started to count correspondence and publish the figures every year. And this spread across Europe and then the Universal Postal Union in 1875 put it on an international basis. By 1900, you could compare the postal flows of practically every country in the world year by year. Now, this is something which we are entirely familiar with, with the digital revolution, when everything, every kind of moment of communication is counted. Well, it starts here. We have the figures to show how behavior changed. And we have the means of knowing, in practice, how much people cared about the kind of drama we're talking about. And the answer is not at all. The postal flows rose continuously and without a break, despite this crisis. Very clear and convincing evidence that in practice people were prepared to take the risks even with the knowledge that the state might open their correspondence and given that the state had refused to offer any assurances about its practices refused to confirm or deny what it was doing nobody knew after 1844 whether the letters were being opened but they were still prepared to take the risk and we can run that forwards 
So the internet companies now struggling with the same issue, how far will their, cons their, their, their users take the risk? How far in practice are they prepared to do this trade knowing as they do what the NSA is going to find out? What's the answer? And you could argue that the current crisis is a godsend to these internet companies. It's a really first class piece of action research. Don't have to go asking people through surveys what they think about privacy and secrecy. Just see how they behave in the midst of this crisis. Now, in the 19th century, the measure was all by the states. In our own times, it's much more in terms of private companies. So share price is a kind of proxy for how the companies are, in fact, doing in the midst of this crisis. This is my last slide. And if you look, the share price of all the major companies have gone up since Snowden. Facebook's has doubled. The others have gone up less rapidly, but gone up. And it is possible that these companies will draw from this crisis a lesson which does not give those in this room much comfort. That in the end, despite all the fuss, it doesn't matter. Certainly those who trade their shares currently believe that. So that's my final point. There is Paul Pry, Sir James Graham, still looking at his letters. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Give me a sign of hand, and did you just raise your hand? I'll come back. I just noticed with the, the, the show. Oh. I, just, I just noticed with the share price, they're all like, there's, there's Apple, there's Microsoft, there's Facebook, and there's Google in there. But um, the parallel between now and back in 1845 yeah. is that the uh, the British government ran a state monopoly on yep. post. There wasn't an alternative postal system in uh, Britain at that time. There wasn't like outpost or open post or something. And the same was also true for mass consumers. Like if I wanted to buy a, an Apple computer that doesn't have all the back doors into it, I can't do that. If I wanted to buy a hard drive that doesn't isn't made in China, isn't it, you know, suspect in its encryption. I can't do that. If I wanted to use a different sort of fa Facebook or not be s as used by Facebook as I am, I, I can't do that. Well, well that's right. But, if you, but you can, you have the choice of not buying a computer and not even engaging in digital communication. And in the 19th century, you had a very real choice of going and talking to people as you always had done, and not engaging in postal communication on the scale that people did. It was a hard choice to make, but the evidence from the 19th century, and again, I think now, though, it's, is, is that that choice was being made in a particular way. I should say that I wouldn't want to push the modern uh, analysis too far. It's very early days yet. It's, Snowden has not yet become a matter for historians, and I think it will take some time if we really know what the impact of the revelations are on digital traffic, but the early signs, as I say, are not comforting. More questions? Paul. Uh, my question is on official secrecy mm -hmm. and uh, the behavior of the GCHQ, mm -hmm. uh, which is your equivalent of the NSA. Yeah. So I'm um, a bit surprised that the reaction of over the Atlantic. In the United States, there was outrage. There were even protests about the NSA. Mm -hmm. But when you go to Britain, apart from the Guardian, you find the GCHQ, there wasn't much outrage as such. It's like business is normal. Is it because uh, that the GCHQ is, is protected by official secrecy and therefore it can justify what it's doing is legal? I just want to hear from you. Uh, well, it partly is that, that uh, it is covered by uh, the Official Secrecy Act, and there's a limit to what, which, what we are allowed to know. Um, it's partly because, in fact, this kind of collusion between the Americans and the British was exposed about 30 years ago in Britain, and we'd kind of forgotten about it. Uh, and politicians are saying, well, look, what's new? 
We've always had, we well, had since the Second World War, uh, this communications capacity, and that capacity has always been linked with the Americans, and we've always known that. And that, I mean, I don't want to push the parallels too far, but go back to 1844. What the government then said when they got caught out was, we've always done this. And they um, responded to the protests by commissioning a secret commission, a committee of inquiry, a select committee, which found precedents for opening letters going all the way back to Shakespeare's time. And they said, governments have always done this, and the opposition who are trashing us at the moment, they were doing it when they were in power. And we did it before them, and they did it before us. So precedents, history, whitewashes us, gets us out of trouble. That, that was their technique then, and to an extent in Britain it's a technique now. You think the Guardian's got itself very upset, thinks the world's changed completely, British government says, yeah. If you knew what was going on, then you knew it was going on. Don't get so excited. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So do I, um, I just have a question about, about what happened later. Because um, when, I, when I see the development, uh, as you compare to now, uh, about postal service and surveillance, yeah. um, do you think um, in, the, in further development uh, in norm, um, well, a norm was created, like um, you should not surveil um, um, postal flow, uh, yeah. flow yeah. which affected governance surveillance, because uh, when, I, or when, I, when I read about surveillance today, I see that um, there seems to be a, um, um, a norm about you should not read yeah. my letters yeah. in, in, in Western society, but yeah. there is a difference to emails. Uh, I, it's one of the curiosities um, of the different kinds of communication that letter writing has been privileged in the way that it has. Um, the protection of the mails goes back to the early 18th century, but it was at this time, as you imply, that it was brought out as a really fundamental ethical value. But what's interesting is, is that it, it remained the main object of concern. We've already got the telegraph coming, the telephone's coming in 1875, um, but if you look at the um, European and United Nations Declarations of Human Rights after the Second World War, this is a century later, it's half a century after the phone's been introduced, it's a century after the telegraph. In those declarations, what's protected is family life and the right to free correspondence. And somehow writing letters has become emblematic, became emblematic of the relationship between the state and private life in a way that other forms of mass communication never did. And why that be, should be so, I'm not entirely sure I understand, but I can, I can just tell you it, 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 it was. Further questions? So I'm, I'm curious about this notion that governments have always spied. And I mean, it's clear that to some extent that's true, but the scale is very different and the relationships are different now. So for example, while governments have always spied, they've also generally considered themselves to be sovereign. So for example, what was the time frame in which the British decided that they would give essentially almost all of their secrets and real-time database access to their allies like the United States? And wasn't it the case that at some point, if the British had handed over that information to the Americans, that it wouldn't have actually been a defensible thing? The US, for example, gives full data feeds to Israel mm -hmm. and they also give it to other partners. And they ask the partners to redact information that is interesting. So for example, if a sitting senator had been wiretapped by the NSA, mm -hmm. they make the Israelis promise that they won't take that data and use it, but instead will delete it. And so that, that to me seems like a fundamental shift when you start to surveil everyone and the national borders come down. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't... Um disagree with that. I mean, the point I made at the time was that, in my paper, was that a, a fundamental contrast between the 19th and, and, and the early part of the 20th century was that the issue of managing surveillance was formally a matter of an individual state. And that, of course, as you uh, are saying, is fundamentally not now the case. The only qualification that I was making was that even in the 19th century, even in 1844, you can see states colluding 
with each other, doing what they can with the t information technology of the time to coordinate their um, uh, actions against what they wouldn't call terrorists, but in fact that's what they thought these people were, I mean, the same, the same mindset. So even then, even with the crude tools that they then had, there was some kind of um, collaboration going on. And as you know, what's interesting about our, this the current crisis is that it, there still is a notion that a state should be in charge of its own secrets, which is colliding with the reality that Snowden is daily putting in front of. So that notion has survived, even though it's become less and less real. But the notion that surveillance somehow is something that a country should place in the context of its own indigenous political traditions and manage in the context of its own political traditions, I think is still with us. And it's set out so clearly in 1844 by the commentators of the time. Uh, just to follow up on that, uh, I'm curious if you think, though, that the, if we look at history and we say that we're sort of trapped in this this uh, lineage where we're, you know there's always been this spying, there'll always be this spying, and that's that's probably true to some degree. I wonder though if these guys have finally crossed the line from defensible and regular, reasonable people think it's fine to they're actually colluding with other governments, secret agencies in a way that they're no longer accountable democratically and they've really crossed boundaries that would normally be considered, I mean, for Snowden to be treasonous for sharing these documents as people have alleged, what is it to share the data from the programs that he has exposed? It seems to me like it's just not credible, but I wonder, historically, it doesn't, I mean, well, no, I, I, th I think it hasn't I, worked out very well I, for us. I mean, I've only been able to give you a, a small sample of the debates of 1844 in, in, in a short paper. I think the rage at the government at the time did um, cover some of the same issues we're now talking about. They, they, there was a, a fundamental hostility to the way Sir James Graham had been behaving. It was thought to be a betrayal of the British state by his collusion with other governments. And it ruined Graham's career. Uh, he never got over it. Um, uh, bitter to the end of his life about the way he'd been treated. He just simply didn't understand what he got himself uh, into. And that cartoon, which I've shown, was one of those rare cartoons which actually made the weather. I mean, most cartoons just pass by and reflect what's going on. That one actually changed people's perceptions, and it's still being talked about in the British press uh, in the early 20th century. It stood for something absolutely real in the, in the, in the minds. And what it, one of the things it stood for was the British Home Secretary doing something at the request of the Austrian government, who were regarded as being a reactionary, repressive regime. So it's, I, I, I said at the beginning of my paper, I don't think history repeats itself. It's not the same. Everything changes. But there are echoes and there are parallels. And I think some of the moral and logical charge we now have is visible in this moment in 1944. It's where it begins. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really so glad that you uh, opened the day to, with all these insights for us because this is exactly what I hope to have as a context to start the other debates of the day from. So thank, thank you, very, you much. very much, sir.